Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council informational meeting. Today's date is Tuesday, July 15th. Welcome to all those in attendance at Carnegie and anybody that might be watching on City Link or on the internet. Appreciate your interest in city government. Um, call our meeting to order and begin with our report from our last Public Services Committee meeting, Councillor Erickson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we at our Public Service uh, Committee, we discussed um, commercial pedal cars. Um, as we know, there's a new business that came downtown Sioux Falls that um, um, does this particular type of business. And so we had asked um, Jim David, Legislative Operations Manager, and Jamie Palmer to come forward and just give us a general report on um, what Minneapolis does since they're the probably closest place that does this kind of business. So it was really just an informational. Um, there wasn't a lot of questions and um, there was no action taken at that time. Thank you. Questions of Councilor Erickson regarding that meeting? Seeing none, we will move on to our next item, which is open discussion. Council, um, tomorrow, just to begin, we have our working session for our, mainly discuss our capital budget, among other few other items. If there is something in the capital budget that you would like um, a department head or somebody from the administration there, please contact either Jim David or Dave Bixler so that those arrangements can be made. Other open discussion? Councilor Jamison. Thank you. Uh, just a uh, item to bring up. I uh, saw the police chief come in, and that's always good to have him here. So now we know we're protected. But uh, no, that's just a joke. I did have a concern or question about uh, the flashing red lights. I don't know if that's anything for us to cover, but um, there's been several accidents that have been resulted in some uh, fatalities. They were all unrelated to at a flashing red light intersection. Certainly they had drunks involved, and that doesn't help. We can't prevent that or stop that. But the flashing red light is a new approach for us. And I'm not sure if it's the right approach or not. I, I appreciate the effort to try to make those intersections move better. I'm all for that. But I'm just wondering if there's an issue there that maybe is starting to come to light uh, based on the accidents that have happened. I uh, didn't know if anybody else had that concern or thought, but um, remember the one at 10th and Sycamore that happened almost immediately after we switched to the red flashing lights after midnight or 11 or something. And then there was just one Saturday night after hot Harley nights. You know, and they're all, I know, involved drunks. But that flashing light does something different to people. A steady red light tells you differently than a flashing red light kind of says stop and go. Just a thought I wanted to bring up uh, if anybody else was concerned about it. And it's something I could cover with the police chief as well. And I know there's good reasons to have it that way, but maybe we need to either do some more education on it or reevaluate. That's all. So. Councillor Anderson. I think that would be something to discuss with Heath over at our traffic services. Um, I think that's probably the route to go with that because they do the setting of all of our traffic lights. So I think that would be a good conversation to have with that department. Councilor Rolfing? Yeah, I would just, just a quick comment about, I'm, I'm wondering how long, and maybe someone here can answer that question, how long those have been on flashing red. It seems to me it's been a lot of years. I think they start about 11 or midnight and, and go until f six in the morning. And um, I know that many of those have, have been that way for a number of years. I mean, 10, 10 years kind of thing. And, and so I'm just wondering if we've just run into a situation where this happened, um, not necessarily because of the red light flashing, but because they just happened. Um, so I, you know, I agree with you. If there's something we can do to make it safer, let's do it. But Right, I think you're right. It did. Uh, they've done it after certain hours, but I think they've moved it to an earlier start recently, and that may be. Uh, and I don't know if there's a sequence of uh, history that we could evaluate based yeah. on when those occurred, and and maybe take a look that way. Yeah, but. that'd be good. Um, from what I remember, I know that 
believe it was at a mayor's listening and learning session here within the last six to nine months that um, a citizen actually asked for more flashing lights at, after certain hours. And I think we increased, and we can confirm this, but the number of flashing lights to by almost 40% at that time. Uh, the mayor thought it was a, a good idea, and it might be a good idea to bring Heath to explain to us maybe the safety implications, maybe somebody from the police department that may have an understanding of why we do this. Uh, maybe, you know, is it a perception of more accidents or is it a reality? Good. And um, it would be, I, I would prefer to do this at an informational meeting for the entire council. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna have Jim David maybe contact those people and see when we can get that scheduled just as, I think that'd be a good informational item for the council as well as the public. So how we decide which lights, you know, where, when, hours, are there safety implications, that type of thing. So, great topic, thank you. Any other open discussion? Do we, should we Counselor? discuss that uh, item we were talking about with the legislative uh, priorities at this point? No, uh, sure, why not? Um, I just, Counselor? Well, I've, I've had a number, for your information, other counselors, I don't know whether you have, but I've had a number of calls on on uh, number four on that, um, on the legislative, um, yeah, the, the uh, owner-occupied, uh, yeah, Sioux, the Sioux Falls City Council supports legislation extending owner-occupied status to income-based rental housing for uh, property tax purposes. And um, it, 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 a lot of landlords have said, you know, that if you're gonna do it for for those people, uh, maybe we should do it for um, everyone who's in an apartment. If they, you know, to those hardworking people deserve that break just as much as some of the other ones. And I, I wonder if here we're saying, at least to me, I think we're saying we support ways to increase low income housing and, and make sure that uh, we have affordable housing here in Sioux Falls. Maybe we could say that differently in number four than uh, income based uh, or, uh, for the owner occupied only that kind of thing and so uh, just just a thought that we might might look at that reword it a little bit because i i support the idea of of um low-income housing and affordable housing in sioux falls but not necessarily where it takes the uh ability of the uh of people who own rental property and makes their property um you know not as valuable or not as rentable Councilor Erpenbach. You know, I would agree with Councilor Rolfing, and I don't support number four the way that it's written. I would ask that we either amend it out or amend it in some way. Absolutely, as you all know, I'm a big advocate for, for affordable housing in, in Sioux Falls, but I think we heard loud and clear on Saturday during our coffee with the council that, that this type of program, when we talk about federal subsidies, is a whole different game than what, what we're dealing with when we're talking about small um, small business owners who own small rental properties. This is a disadvantage to them. It is not an advantage to them to have us give yet another incentive to companies that are being essentially federally subsidized. And I, I don't <coughs> support it the way that it's worded. You can jiggle it around however you want. If you want to say it just a generic, we support affordable housing initiatives or whatever, I'm fine with that. But anything beyond that, I just really am not I think we're doing a disservice to, to small business owners in Sioux Falls to, to say it the way that we that it's written in number four. I don't see any other hands going up. I'd just like to chime in on this a little bit, I guess. Um, I'm open to amending it, not to even considered about pulling it, but remember this is a provisional legislative priorities list. We still have to work with our South Dakota Municipal League and I don't want it to disappear completely. And if there is a way to make, keep it out there, because not, not every community, a lot of them, and especially the bigger communities, are struggling with affordable housing. I think Sioux Falls probably has the biggest issues. So I don't want to pull it completely, and I would be open to ways to amend it, um, just so that we can maybe discuss it more as an affordable housing issue than anything else. So we've got time between now and when that's voted on later this evening. And if um, 
any discussion wants to occur, let it happen. Councilor Erpenbach. So can I just clarify then what you mean by a provisional um, list? This would be the list then that we would take to South Dakota Municipal League in August when, when we look at policy, the policy committees meet in August. And many of us are members of those committees. Many, many of us will be there. If that number four goes to our meetings in peer, as members of those committees, we have to be able to, def to defend those items in those committees. I just am concerned that having it in there and having us so iffy on whether it should even be there, I would prefer that we either really clarify it or take it out completely because it's going to be difficult for us to deal with the other municipalities and at municipal league policy meetings uh, with the way that it's worded now. So. I would agree wholeheartedly. To pull it or to, or to amend it or to clarify it? To, to clarify it. Either we clarify it the way we want it or we, or we take it out. Okay. 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 Any other discussion? I do have one more item, totally non related to that. Uh, lately, we've had some discussion and um, some press regarding um, how activities of our police department when they're pursuing a suspect um, and damaging property, what implications that have to the city as far as being able to compensate those um, property owners for damages, that type of thing. And I've asked uh, Dave Fifely uh, to come and maybe give, give us an explanation of what governs what we can and cannot do. Well, thank you, Dean Karski. Um, I guess what people need to keep in mind is we have a state constitutional provision that provides that uh, certainly taxes collected have to be spent for a public purpose, not for a private purpose. And there are some state statutes that provide immunity to law enforcement officers responding to emergencies, which this situation was. Certainly our office, uh, me personally, along with our Keith Allenstein, uh, we reviewed all the police reports on a particular incident that had been reported. And it was a, uh, certainly we did not see anything that went beyond the scope of duty for the law officers, and the chief is here today too, but we didn't see anything that went beyond the scope of their duty. We didn't see anything that was reckless or wanton. Uh, and again, we have immunity we have to be careful with those public funds in terms of not providing funds for a private purpose. And since we have immunity and the officers were within the scope of their duty uh, under the Constitution, the state of South Dakota, we can't pay that type of claim. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that about 70 or 80 years ago, and actually about 1932, our state Supreme Court addressed this issue where there was a uh, a lot of cattle losses sounds very familiar to last uh, spring with the uh, western South Dakota blizzards. There were a lot of cattle in, uh, being lost across the state in 1932 and the state Supreme Court was asked to opine on with this constitutional provision can we provide funds to private uh, livestock owners for feed and so forth and the court was very compassionate and understanding in terms of we can understand where you'd want to pay those types of claims and you feel like you want to do something good for people but you need to be aware it has to be for a public not for a private purpose and our state supreme court said you can't do that you know, where you provide these livestock each individual livestock owner a payment or some type of loan specific loan program so i think that's indicative and certainly these types of things can certainly give you a knee-jerk reaction where, yes, why don't we pay that? But certainly under the state constitution, we have to go beyond that and be objective beyond our gut reaction, not be visceral and say, legally, we can't pay this. And that's why that claim was denied. Questions of uh, our legal counsel, Council Staggers. Well, I've been talking to a number of people about this, and people have been talking to me about this. And uniformly, people are saying the city of Sioux Falls should pay for this. Now, I've talked to a um, retired sheriff from Yankton County. I've talked to a former highway patrolman. And when I asked them a question, they said without hesitation, no, the city should pay for it. And apparently, uh, Yankton County has also in the past um, on a very limited scale, uh, made some payment uh, on something similar to this. This, uh, when I take a look at it, 
uh, is not for a public, for a private purpose, uh, paying for the damage that the police did. Now, I think we all agree, of course, uh, the person who should pay for this is the criminal. But that's not going to happen immediately. And so, since we do have the police directly doing this uh, to somebody that's totally innocent, that had nothing at all to do with this, uh, and it's such a minor amount, at least from the city's <coughs> perspective, compared to our budget, uh, we should be doing this. And to me, it would be a public purpose to pay for it. And the reasons for a public purpose is because the police did the damage. And so I think we ought to take responsibility here uh, for what the police department did. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad they got the criminal. I'm glad they got the bad guy. But also at the same time, we do have innocent people being involved here um, and have lost some of their property and they should be compensated for it. If I could add to Councillor Stagger's comments and, and maybe you could address it all at once. Um, David, I think back to not that many months ago, we had a case, and I don't think it was the Sioux Falls Police Department, but maybe a sheriff's deputy that was pursuing somebody at the corner of 41st and Sertoma Avenue and um, with lights and sirens on and went through a, the red light and hit another vehicle. And in that case, the um, individual that was hit was compensated. Um, I don't know if there's a, an issue of negligence there. Um, can you maybe add to Councillor Staggers and well, my questions? Well, certainly uh, these decisions aren't made in a vacuum, and uh, Sioux Falls is part of the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance, which is a liability pool among a number of local governments, one of, and we're one of the founding members of it uh, for historical purposes in about 1980s, late 80s. But, we had them also independently review this, and certainly uh, uh, they also agreed that the claim should be denied. And again, uh, Councilor Karski, I'm not aware of the specific facts on why that claim was compensated, uh, but again, uh, and I wouldn't even want to speculate if it was reckless or wanton or some other conduct that may have brought it into the realm of, of being liable, but unless the city is legally liable, we have to, you know, be the, the guardians and watchdogs of those public funds for a public purpose only. What would constitute our liability? If we had wanton or reckless uh, conduct, uh, the easiest example for this set of facts is the officers went to the wrong house, messed up the address, kicked in the wrong door. We would pay for the new door, the new door jam, et cetera. That would be different. But again, the, the state statutes are specifically recognizing that you know, officers are performing a duty under emergency situations. This was a fleeing individual, armed and dangerous. Uh, we had a severe public safety emergency going on. And certainly state law is providing that we had every right and it was justified to deny that claim. Other questions, Councilor Anderson. David, uh, does the county still have a victim reimbursement fund? Yes, Councillor. I think the the property owners uh, were directed to that. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of being a victim of a crime by this particular individual. How is that fund funded? I can't tell you off the top of my head. I haven't been a state's attorney in 16 years. I can't tell you off the top of my head. I'm assuming it's from... Uh, fines, et cetera, assessed through the criminal court system. Could we find out on that too? I'd like to know exactly how that's funded. Because you're saying that we can't use state funds or tax funds or whatever to compensate victims, yet we have a victim well, compensation that... fund. We also used to compensate the uh, pawn shops when we re got their stolen products. So. How, how did this all come about? Where did those funds come from? I guess that would be a good research project for someone to educate us a little bit further on this. Very good. Councilor Staggers? Yes, also just thinking about another possibility in the future that uh, we might have a um, policeman in a police car chasing after a bad guy. And in the process, uh, the police car runs into a 
another private vehicle. Are we saying we would not pay for them? I hate to put See, Chief Barcel on the line, but Chief, do you know the how pursuit the laws are governed as far as red lights? I, I believe that police officers that are involved in a pursuit are still um, have to follow the rules of the road even with their lights on. Is that correct? Sorry to drag you into this, Chief. You weren't here for this. Oh, that's why I'm here. Doug Barthel, Police Chief. Uh, well, officers are, are uh, given some certain exceptions when in pursuit. They have to have red lights and sirens activated uh, to be able to basically not abide by the certain traffic regulations. Now, that doesn't give us open authority to drive however we'd like. The accident that you referred to at 41st and Sertoma, that involved a... Uh, a South Dakota Highway Patrol trooper, um, which we investigated. We actually wrote the trooper a ticket for failure to stop for that red light. So uh, I have no idea what, what was eventually worked out as far as civil, uh, the civil portion of that, whether or not they were found liable and had to make payment. Uh, it's hard to say, as is the case with any accident where we investigate it. Uh, we investigate the criminal side of it. Uh, if there's a possible violation, then we may or may not issue a citation. We never determine who's responsible civilly to pay for that. Um, so it would all, you know, it, there's so many what ifs that go with that, that question to uh, determine whether or not the officer would actually have acted outside of his, his authority or, or was reckless in his manner. You know, say we're in a downtown area and the officer's driving 100 miles an hour trying to chase someone. I mean, there are certain things where you, you kind of get beyond where it's safe and reasonable and, and then you start to cross into that area where we would be liable. Um, you know, in this, if I may, in this particular situation, uh, you know, it was, as uh, David said, there certainly was some risk to uh, not only the public but our officers. We had information that this man was, was armed and dangerous and had openly said uh, that when he encountered police he was going to shoot it out with us. So. Uh, this wasn't just a random apartment that he went to. He actually knew the man that lived there. It was an acquaintance of his. Uh, I won't get into the whole background of that relationship and, and their uh, backgrounds in particular, but the man wasn't home. The door was locked, and that's when he then kicked in the door and, uh, and went in. Uh, we used you know, uh, the, the least invasive procedure we could to uh, eventually get him out of there. Um, you know, frankly, we could have filled the place with tear gas and uh, uh, probably made the place inhabitable, but in the end, got the man. Um, uh, we didn't do that. The damage was minimal. It's unfortunate that there was some damage caused, but uh, again, it isn't uh, me or our department that determines who pays for it. Um, it. But I do think we have to be careful in what sort of precedent we set uh, because the next situation may not have quite this set of circumstances, but maybe it's close. And so where do you draw the line? And uh, um, I think uh, it, it's rare that we're going to have an occasion like this, but, uh, and it's unfortunate that it happened to them. Um, but there are many situations where we have innocent victims. And for the department to become the, the middle person that, that makes the payment, and then we in turn have to collect that, I think is the wrong business to get into. Uh, the proper avenue is through restitution. There is a, a victim's compensation fund, uh, um, and I believe that's funded through fines. Uh, there's a portion of that that goes to that fund, so it isn't necessarily tax dollars. So as to your question, uh, Councillor Anderson, that um, is how that fund works. Uh, that's probably not the best use for that fund. This situation, as I said, it's restitution. And as Councillor Stagger said, really the the person that's responsible for this and needs to pay for the damage is the guy that uh, caused all the problems to begin with. Thank you very much, Chief. And my job probably is, is this situation is a thousand what ifs and you could ask that question all day long. So thank you. Okay, Councilor Steggers. Yeah, uh, Doug, I agree with you. We have to watch about the precedent. And the concern I have is that we could have this happen again in the future where there's a totally innocent um, homeowner, apartment owner, whatever, they get stuck with something like this. 
I mean, the Grahams, in this case, they weren't there. They, they had absolutely nothing to do with this. However, in this case, whether we like it or not, the police were involved in causing the damage, and the bad guy, you know, forced him to do that. I, I agree, the bad guy should pay, obviously. So why should the, the innocent people who had absolutely nothing to do with this seek the restitution? The police should seek the restitution. It's, it's somewhat similar, oh, I'm sorry, it's somewhat similar to a, uh, a landlord that rents to a drug dealer. Uh, that and I'm not saying that they're exactly that way, but uh, just as an example, in that situation, if if we end up having to do a search warrant and it's a no-knock warrant where we physically do damage to open the door, uh, we as a general rule do not pay for that damage. It's the landlord uh, is responsible for that, and they in turn have to get that from their renter. The, again, it's the renter or the the drug dealer in that case that's ultimately responsible but uh, there is a certain amount of risk that goes along with uh, renting to people of that nature and and I know they can't be certain of that in every case uh, but um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail but there's there's a little more behind the scenes with uh, with this particular situation but either way I I don't think it's uh, Ultimately, I don't. I don't think the city's responsible. It isn't a question of the thousand or two thousand dollars. It's just. It's more of a question of is the city ultimately the one responsible for that damage? I'm going to move us along now. Um, thank you, Chief. I guess the best thing to say is there is a process, and this has been given full consideration. Um, whether we like the outcome or agree with it is probably not up to us, so we'll move on from here. Our first presentation, unless there's other open discussion, seeing none, I'm going to call up Sue Kwanbeck Etten from Central Services to get us, get us moving. Thank you, Sue. Good afternoon. Sue Kwanbeck Etten, Director of Central Services. I'm here today to uh, present to you uh, our next presenter, actually, Adrian Herbst. Um, there's an agenda item tonight on the city council meeting for a resolution that will extend the current OVS license to WOW. O OVS is Open Video System License. That's what allows them to um, serve cable services <coughs> up to the city. And the city has the license. Um, the certification itself is granted and regulated through the FCC not by the city. So what the resolution is, is to extend the license for an additional five years. And that's what the resolution is um, on the agenda tonight. So I've been working with uh, Karen Leonard out of the city attorney's office, as well as Adrian Herbst, um, to go through a compliance review over these last several months um, before we would um, recommend the OVS license be extended. So I want to introduce Adrian Herbst. He's a principal with the Washington DC based law firm, Baller Herbst Law Group. He's in charge of the Minneapolis office. He has over 35 years of experience in municipal and governmental work with an emphasis on cable, television, franchising and regulation, new and emerging technologies, services related to cable, telecom, internet, municipal legal and regulatory matters. He has been extensively involved in representing local governments throughout the country on these matters. He's a frequent participant and presenter um, at municipal, legal, and administrative conferences. He also was a city council member for the city of Bloomington, Minnesota for 16 years, and he was their city attorney for seven years. He has served as a past president of the Minnesota Trial Lawyers Association, vice president of the League of Minnesota Cities, He's a charter member of NATOA, the National Association of Telecommunication Officers and Advisors, and also a member of the Alliance for Community Media, as well as various other legal organizations. So I'd like to introduce Adrian to uh, present to you today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. I have been here before. I think some of you may remember me. I think it was a few years ago with a cable franchise or something, but. Um, your staff asked me to come and talk to you today a little bit about this application that you have to extend an OVS, 
open video services license. <laughs> and the reason is, is because it's a little bit unique. It's actually not a cable system. Um, the identity or the business uh, approval, so to speak, is actually by the FCC, not by local government like a cable television franchise is. So what I did is I prepared a brief overhead presentation to help you understand it a little bit uh, before you go ahead and approve this extension of license. And it'll take me about five, ten minutes if that will work out. Go ahead. A um, little bit of background might be helpful for you. Uh, the license was originally granted in this city uh, to a company called Prairie Wave back in 2005. And it was for 10 years, and now there will be an extension of five years, and that's what's being requested. Uh, Prairie Wave transferred it to Knology in 2007. Uh, then Knology transferred it to Wide Open West, the current operator. Uh, and it is this current operator, Wide Open West, that has the license and is asking for the five-year extension of the license. Go ahead. Um, I think the basic reason for requesting the extension is that the license is going to expire uh, this year. And unless it's renewed, revoked, or terminated sooner, which there, to my knowledge, is no reason for any of that to occur, uh, it can be extended for five years. And what has to be involved in this is you have under the license agreement certain compliance provisions. And here's basically what it says. It says that the obligation with regard to this system uh, they have an obligation for upgrading and building their system to serve your community. They have to have good customer services. They have to abide by the gross revenue fee payment under the license uh, to the city. They have to provide community programming and access to their facilities to develop public educational and governmental access. And they have to maintain the system so that it is technically meeting FCC standards of, of system performance and quality programming. Go ahead. Um, often confused with a cable system, OVS system is different and an OVS operator is not subject to the same kind of extensive regulatory requirements as a cable service operator, uh, which I, I think is uh, important to keep in mind and I'll help you understand why. Go ahead. Um, the Cable Act, there was a federal Cable Act that was passed in 1984. And what happened was Congress decided that they were going to go ahead because there was a hodgepodge of franchises throughout the whole country on cable services. And by adopting uh, the Federal Cable Act, they were gonna establish some uniform standards throughout the country that would apply to all communities. But at that time, back in 1984, you had sort of the beginnings of the cable industry. The cable companies were very small, just getting off the ground. So Congress plugged into this law something called cross-ownership rules. And basically what that was is that newspapers, local newspapers and local cable or local telephone companies could not, within the area that they have subscribers and provide services, they could not have a cable television franchise or license. Because the idea was is they would have a, an advantage over the fledging or beginning new cable companies. And so they had this cross ownership rule that said, look, we're not going to let you guys provide cable television systems or services in your newspaper area or your telephone area. Well, as you all know, between that time, 1984 and 1996, the cable television industry in this country grew dramatically. You know, you have the Comcast now and Time Warners and, uh, you know, just a whole flock of different cable companies uh, have built systems and now, of course, are merging and consolidating and so on. Well, in 1996, Congress took another look at it and said, well, wait a minute, there's something else going here. And all of a sudden, the cable companies have an advantage over the local telephone companies and the local newspapers. So why don't we let the local newspapers, the local uh, telephone companies, if they want to, provide something like cable television services and, and, and provide a video service in competition with the cable operators because competition is good and healthy. So they created something, and it's not defined as a cable service under the Federal Cable Act or the law in 1996. Go ahead. Um, they eliminated the cross-ownership rules, and they said, look, we're going to let the uh, local newspapers and the local telephone companies provide a video service, but it's going to be different than a cable television operator. 
And uh, in order to allow fair and equitable competition of the cable service providers, uh, they created this OVS or open video service con uh, concept. And basically what's involved here is that if you're an OVS operators, uh, up to two thirds of the channels that you have or the ca uh, capacity of that system has to be open to somebody else, to non-affiliated operators to put programs on uh, that system. So uh, if, if people like that would like to do so. So in other words, a cable operator owns their system, they buy the programs, they replay it on the cable system, they use 100% of the capacity of that cable system to do so. An open video service, that's where the term comes from, it's open to others than the owner to provide programming uh, to households or business uh, within the community. So this, that whole idea was invented in 1996 and there are still communities in the country, in, including yours, that have OVS systems and OVS licenses. We could go on and talk about new technologies and changes uh, which have occurred now where this maybe is not as needed as it was back in 1996. Go ahead. Um, the Cable Act definition of cable service is used in the Act, as I said, excludes OVS, and as a result, uh, OVS operators are not subject to the same kind of laws and like I was mentioning at the beginning, it's the Federal Communication Commission that certifies an OVS operator, not a local government. Uh, but what you guys are in charge of, frankly, is to license the use of your right-of-way to protect the infrastructure of a right-of-way and in return for that have some things coming back to your community. Go ahead. Uh, and some of the things that you can do as a local government is you can have ownership restrictions and that you can enforce the requirement on the amount of programming that they have or don't have. Uh, you, you can require them to carry the local broadcast stations, for example. Uh, you can require them to have non-commercial educational television. Uh, just so there are certain things that you can do. Um, protection of subscriber privacy, equal employment opportunities, all those things don't sound a whole lot about uh, cable television systems, systems, but they are matters that you as a local government have the right to oversee for people that are using your public right of way. Um, the FCC has uh, been adopted to enforce the OVS requirements, as I, I mentioned. Uh, they have a review process. They can, if there are complaints about an OVS operator, it doesn't come to you as a local government. It's up to the FCC to resolve disputes or arguments about whether indeed they are operating properly or not within a community. Go ahead. Um, localities can require an OVS operator to obtain a franchise or license to use your right of way, which is what I'm talking about. Localities can charge a fee, just like a cable operator does, and it can be as high as 5% of the gross revenues. In this case, the license fee is 3%, and I think it's barely uh, equal to what you have for your cable operators. I think that's like 25 or 3% as well. Uh, you can require and impose non-discriminatory, competitively neutral regulations on OBS pro uh, uh, providers using your right-of-way, uh, just the same as you would uh, apply to anybody that digs or builds or constructs within your right-of-way, and you can enforce those right-of-way standards and you can require local PEG or public educational and governmental access programming requirements. Go ahead. Um, getting to the process that was followed, it was re it, it, uh, the due diligence, as was just stated, um, your license agreement with uh, the company right now has certain conditions or requirements that the city is supposed to look at and you as a council are supposed to consider uh, before approving the extension. The first one has to do with whether or not um, they have provided certain information to the city uh, that is understandable and, and will provide you about their past performance. So what we did is we sent them a request for information asking for detailed information about their operations, uh, their services, where they are, their finances, uh, their legal, technical, and financial qualifications and uh, a detailed summary was put together, very responsive by what, while they put together, together a very excellent report for the city, which is now a record for the city. Go ahead. Um, 
one of the requirements in your license says that they have uh, provided upgrades and changes to extend their system throughout the city, uh, but they're not required to do so unless they've been requested to do so or if it's reasonably or economically feasible. Uh, right now, I understand they have about 70 square miles of property that they are serving, or 70 miles of right away that they are serving. Uh, they do not have any current plans to extend. There hasn't been any further requests uh, for extension, nor has the city requested that they do so. So it would be my conclusion that uh, they've satisfied that requirement and it can be met by a finding by you. Um, go ahead. The license agreement includes a requirement for compliance with customer service requirements. Uh, they've provided a, a great deal of detailed information about their uh, customer service reps, uh, their toll-in call, uh, call uh, numbers that people can reach for technical help, uh, and they're on top of the whole business of making sure that the customers have access to them for any sort of problems. And they produced a record that def definitely indicated that they as a company have very, very few customer service complaints or problems with their system. So it's our conclusion that you should be able to make a favorable finding on that particular requirement. Go ahead. Um, the license fee, again, requires uh, a 3% of gross revenues. Uh, they have furnished a record showing compliance with that requirement. Your city staff doesn't have any information uh, that would suggest that they have not paid on time uh, or that they are default of any franchise fee or license fee payments. So you should be in a position to make a finding of compliance with that requirement. Next. Um, the license agreement requires availability of programming on access channels. And again, uh, all of the information that has been gathered by the city definitely demonstrates and supports the fact that they are in compliance with that requirement and you should be able to make a positive finding on that requirement. <coughs> the next. The information states that it is in compliance with technical service standards, and there are a host of technicals, technical standards with the FCC, as well as under your ordinances, to make sure that the picture quality is maintained, uh, that they provide prompt service, that they do regular performance checks, and twice annually, they file proof with the Federal Communication Commission that they've done a technical study of their system and that it is fully operational, that it is in technical compliance with all of the FCC standards. So again, you should be able to make a finding that they are in compliance with that uh, requirement. Next slide. Um, Basically then, what we've reviewed is on a very quick basis here, uh, there are these five different standards that you built into your license agreement that is supposed to be reviewed, that you as the governing body of the city are supposed to have a basis or support for. Your staff has developed a record uh, working together with WOW uh, that I think is very extensive, very well done, and fully and completely supports positive findings on all of these requirements. So I would be glad to answer any questions. And uh, again, it's uh, a lot of people call it a cable system, but it's not. It's an open video system. <laughs> it's uh, just a kind of a different term. Open video meaning they have to be open to others that want to be, put programming on their system. Uh, thank you, Mr. Herbson. Just in interest of full disclosure, you are here at the request of the city and not of WOW Entertainment. Is that yes, correct? No, yes, no. I, uh, <laughs> In fact, in my business, I think uh, they read, you know, I uh, had a background of being a city attorney and a councilman and uh, fortunately had the right to be involved at the beginning of cable television. And you kind of had to pick your sides at the beginning. Either you represent the government or you represent the cable companies because neither wanted any conflict. So I chose at the very beginning of the game to represent only local governments and my firm just represents local governments throughout the country on these matters. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Herbst, or Sue, or Councillor Staggers? Yes, uh, you Herbst. mentioned that uh, uh, WOW would have to pay 3% of their income to the city. Uh, do you know what that was this last year, how much money we got from the city? I, I saw the figures, I don't recall. Do you know offhand what um, it was? Well, it's, I can get you the exact figures, but somewhere in the vicinity, about $2,500 per month okay. is what they end up paying to us. Okay. Councillor Jameson. 
That was the exact question that I had. That's all. Thank you. And to follow up on that, the three percent is what is currently be, being paid, but we have the ability to ch charge up to five percent. Well, uh, yes, you would legally. On the other hand, you have a contract here where you agreed to limit it to yes. three percent, so you couldn't unilaterally change it right now. Yeah. And the, uh, so we're in renewing the contract. We're renewing it as it stands at the three percent. You're extending the current franchise, not renewing it. If you were to renew it, then it would be open. Uh, you have a right under this Federal Cable Act that I talked about and FCC rules, you can charge up to 5% of the gross revenue of cable companies. In the case of OVS, it suggests the same thing under applicable laws. So renewing versus extending, there is a semantics in what it means, and um, by renewing it, we are saying we're going to keep it the same. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Rolfing. Do you, uh, do you know if Knowledge, or I mean WOW, has any um, ambitions to provide service to the entire city as part of this? Or I, I see, say here they don't at right now, but uh, is that something that could be extended so we have a little more competition? Uh, well, uh, maybe they could answer that. They told me that they do not have a plan to do so this year. But during the year of tw uh, 2015, they are going to be taking a look at it. They don't right now because there, there hasn't been a demand, uh, either to the city or by the city or by residents for them to expand or extend their system. So, I mean, um, yes, they, they serve, frankly, a small area of the community, not the whole community. But the service that they provide, I understand, is, is very good quality. They're very prompt in their services and are doing a good job, and to the best of my knowledge, they've had very few complaints for, from customers, uh, which says, you know, from a performance standpoint, that they have a darn good track record uh, in your community. And frankly, they'd probably be a good competitor. Councilor Staggers? Yes, every year I call them to find out if they're gonna be expanding further in the city of Sioux Falls. But I've also discovered, too, that maybe one reason they're not expanding as much is because their competition has some technical ways that they've been able to continue operating um, to make sure they, they, they have a lot of the business. That they what? That they, they have a lot of the business. It it's, makes it a little more difficult to compete with them. You mean the, the current cable operator, some technical stuff? Yes, that right, with their cable or something, yes. Right, can you, I've do you know anything about that, that I'd, one? I'd be very surprised at that, actually. Uh, as a matter of fact, the way the technology is now in this business, it would be very hard for anybody to block anybody, you know. In this day and age, you have streaming video through the internet, you have phone companies and all sorts of people providing it in different ways. The United States Supreme Court just a couple of weeks ago issued a ruling in a case called Aerial, uh, which is a company that was plucking off the air, the broadcast signals, and providing it free to people. They said that's illegal. <laughs> now these guys are going to get in the business of providing cable service, and so it, it's um, it, it, it's what keeps me going because this thing is changing all the time. But there are new and competitive ways technologies change, and. Um, I don't think uh, that the cable company would have any ability to block them from expanding or extending their services if they did. Uh, that would be a real problem. Thank you. I know um, Rex, is it Butkenbach? Is that how you said? Is here from WOW. Did, um, did you have comments, sir, or any questions from counselors? Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer other questions if you have them, too. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Rex Butenbach, and I'm uh, one of the newest residents of Sioux Falls. I just moved in last week down at 95th and Western. So to, to answer uh, uh, Councilman Staggert, every year I review, and I've been on board now with WOW for a year, but the, the last year I review the cost to build an extension based on what requests I've had. Um, I've not had a lot of requests for extension of services. I would review it, you know, 
diligently to see if it's extension. Some of our determinations, what we can and can't build, is based upon the economic feasibility of the extending plant. Um, it's, it, it's still an expensive game. I, I can testify that at no time did my competition for mid-continent ever put any technical barriers or physical barriers in the extension of plant I, at all. Uh, Mid-Continent and I both have a role to play and, and so our service can in hand in times to, uh, when we're working in a mutual exclusive area or a mutual acceptable area. But the extension of plant is based on economic feasibility. Um, a little bit more background, if I may. WOW is the latest in the predecessors. Originally started off with the tele, uh, Dakota Telephone Co-op. We're originally an ILEC telephone company who serviced areas south of Sioux Falls, Yankton, Beersford, Irene, um, North Sioux City, et cetera. We were a telephone company who had areas outside of Sioux Falls. And as Sioux Falls grew south, it started to, to grow into the area that at that time was Prairie Way. So we're a telephone company doing what the FCC thought to build competition, which was start an open video system license in your telephone community, which is what we've done. We would love to service all of Sioux Falls, but our, we're concentrating on the areas that is our piece of, of the of operation, which is, is some of the, a fifth of the city of Sioux Falls. Um, I'm very proud of my techs my customer service, but not least that I have a 140 person headcount call center in Sioux Falls that my calls are answered by. I have over 250 employees that report out of my Sioux Falls operation that work for me. They work and pay taxes and live in all communities, but predominantly Sioux Falls. Uh, our offices on Broadband Lane uh, do ha does house my call center. I'm very proud of that we respond same day with service issues, respond same day on installation issues. We step on our feet from time to time, but it's not, it's an error. Um, but conversely, we run one less than one service call per, per day sometimes in Sioux Falls. My techs do a great job. Um, being a telephone company in the past meant certain technical standards were developed that we have to comply with, uh, which benefits the video side and, vid and benefits the internet side. I'm here if you have any questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Rex. Appreciate it. This is going to be item number 34 on our city council meeting tonight. <clears throat> it is a resolution, so it will be voted on for approval at that time. Councilor Rolfing. I, um, I need to... Uh congratulate uh, Mr. Buchelman's parents on the selection of a great first name. <laughs> We've talked about that in the past, and I agree with you. <laughs> I think our questions are done then. All righty. <laughs> so item 34 tonight. Thank you to everybody. Uh, and thank you to WOW for, you know, the employees and bringing the jobs to Sioux Falls. So. Um, next item on our informational meeting agenda is the presentation of Sioux Falls tomorrow. And have Mr. Cooper, welcome. Good afternoon, counselors. Uh, Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services. Uh, joining me today, Mary Tidwell, who served as the chair of our steering committee for Sioux Falls tomorrow 2014, and Andy Patterson with the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation, which really led this process for us. Uh, today we're going to be giving you an overview of the process that we went through to develop this document as well as the outcome. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to start out with is why do we go through these community visioning processes? This is the third time now that we've done this, uh, 1994, 2004, and now 2014. As we began this third uh, version of Sioux Falls Tomorrow, uh, we were asked to go back and look at some of the goals, the priorities that were identified back in 2004. And you have a handout today. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but we do have extra copies of that for the public. 
and it's called Sioux Falls Tomorrow 2, a review of what we accomplished. And we went through each of those major community focus areas and again talked about what were some of the accomplishments, some of the initiatives, some of the uh, successes that we can go back and say, these were identified 10 years ago and look what we've accomplished. And I think as you start to scan through that list, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and one thing that Andy will talk to you about today is that with Sioux Falls tomorrow, we don't specifically say who's going to be doing what, but we do want to have a process, again, for following up on this and, and measuring the results, and that's really what the important part of Sioux Falls tomorrow is all about. The city of Sioux Falls was one of the sponsors. Uh, we contributed $5,000 toward this process that came out of our budget, and so again, um, very excited today to present to you uh, an overview. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary, again, who served as chair of our steering committee. Mary Tidwell. Welcome, Mary. Good afternoon, gentlemen, ladies. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today because something very wonderful happened during the last six months in the Sioux Falls Tomorrow 2014 project. I first of all want to thank you very much for your financial support of this project. Along with you, the Minnehaha County, Lincoln County, the Sioux Falls School District, the Sioux Falls, Forward Sioux Falls um, project, which is both the Chamber and the um, Development Foundation, um, the United Way and the Sioux Falls School District were also sponsors. So we had broad support. Our participation was also broad in the number of people and from where they came, from the counties around surrounding us. Um, just a few words about the process before we get into the results. The committee, the steering committee started meeting all last fall to plan for this project. Although it had been done before, 10 years later, some things have to be adjusted. Um, Mike served on the steering committee for the, the city and was a, a valuable asset in doing the analysis of the previous um, project and helping us set the, the tone for the new one. We uh, recruited five individuals to help us lead what we called KPAs, key performance areas. That was, they were economic vitality, education, quality of life, uh, social services, and local government. We then uh, brainstormed and invited um, probably 100 people to be what we called stakeholders. They were people that came to these meetings and gave their opinions. We made a conscious effort to reach out to people, not just from Sioux Falls, but from surrounding communities that were in, the other, in Lincoln County. We made a conscious effort to reach out to especially um, those people probably from 30 to 50 in age, because they're the people that are going to be our future leaders. And we were really pleased that we had about 90 of those people commit to six meetings, formal meetings, and probably two to five outside meetings for their particular KPA uh, work area. In addition, when we put an online survey and a survey in the Argus Leader, where people could, could give their input through the survey, we had another 50 people volunteer to be a part of the committee, or the process. So we ended up with about 140 stakeholders that attended one or more meetings, and indeed almost 120 that were regular participants in the process. So we felt it was broad-based by age, by uh, geographic representation, by um, male, female, and by um, occupations. We were very pleased with the amount of people that were involved. We were also kind of blown away in that the survey, we expected a, several hundred responses. We got 2,600 responses, which is a pretty good thing for something online that you have to seek or you have to take out of the Argus and fill in and mail to us. So we were very, very pleased with the input we had. The six sessions were held in the evening. Um, they were work sessions. They went from 5.30 to usually 8 or 8.30. In addition, each person was assigned or chose a particular KPA to work in. And during that time, during the process, they would have outside meetings in addition to just the general meetings. So it was a great investment of time and energy on, a, on part of a lot of people. And we're pretty proud of the final document. The, probably the, the overriding thing that had to be established was a general vision statement for the city of Sioux Falls. And this, or for the area, I should say, not the city. And it's important, I think, that you understand that this vision statement um, might be somewhat idealistic or high, 
pie in the sky, but the specific KPAs work to quantify and, and define how we get to this vision statement. So I want to read that to you. Just You've probably seen it, but it's the Sioux Falls community is care, safe, caring, progressive, and beautiful, providing opportunities and resources for each person's well-being. You know, that does say a lot. <laughs> But as Andy's going to tell you in just a minute, there's some pretty clear-cut ways that, that the community feels we can reach this, this vision. This study is a little different from every other study, or this project is different from every other project, in that it's not, we didn't hire anybody from the outside to come in and run it. We didn't, um, we didn't have a select committee, a blue ribbon panel, deal with the issue. This was everybody that wanted to come. We had one evening where people could just come in and talk to any group they wanted. Um, so this is the people's vision for Sioux Falls. And it has been, I think, a helpful document in the last 20 years in getting us where we are, and we hope it will continue for the next 10. I want to turn it over to Andy now, because he will give you some more specifics. And then if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Andy Patterson with the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation, and uh, the Community Foundation was pleased to be able to provide some of the administrative support on this and be one of the uh, the sponsors. And just to maybe reiterate just a minute uh, what on what Mary said, uh, we were thrilled by our community's response to this. Uh, at every step of the way, when we offered an opportunity to come and provide input, we had more than we expected. And I think that that says a lot about our fellow citizens. Uh, and that, to me, is a really exciting piece to be able to report back to you. Um, I wanted to highlight a few things, and I don't want to go line by line or goal by goal in this document here, but I wanted to highlight a few things, and hopefully uh, you'll have time uh, uh, later on to, to spend a little bit more um, uh, looking at this. This, you know, I come in here with a, a bound document, and it's easy to say, here's a plan or a strategic plan, and really, um, I think it's important to not think of this as a plan as much as this is the voice of the people. Uh, we tried to have a real open uh, opportunity for people to express their voice, express their opinion, and we hope that this plan is reflective of the voice of the people and their dreams for their community. And to think of it as that instead of an action plan that we're, we're presenting to you today. Um, as Mary said, the, a vision statement was agreed upon by this group. Um, and just I should note that this uh, is available online at SiouxFallsTomorrow.com. You could download it. Um, you can contact the Community Foundation. We can get that for you. We've also made it available through uh, Siouxland Libraries if you would uh, like to be able to look at uh, this document. Um, in addition to the vision statement, um, in this document you will see uh, the results of the survey. Uh, we had 2,600 responses, 2,000 comments that, that we got to go through and classify, and you'll see a representative sample of those if you want a flavor of the, uh, what we were hearing in that survey. And then you'll see those, those five key performance areas um, and specific goals and action items that those groups spent a lot of time working on. And as we put together the report and kind of went through and heard from uh, people in the community about trends and events, so we looked at the survey, uh, there were some what I will call overarching themes that developed. And just to hit on those, and I'm going to touch on just a, a little bit of what, you, what each of the group uh, covered. I think the first thing that we heard is that uh, the citizens want to keep the city moving forward. And that sounds very general, but I think they're identifying what has been happening in Sioux Falls and that we want to see that continue to happen. We don't want to retreat from this. We want to keep moving forward um, with what we've been seeing. The second one um, that started really with um, probably hearing some of the trends from the school district and, and the community about just the increasing diversity we're seeing in our community. Um, and I think most of us um, recognize that, but when you start seeing some of the numbers, you're really uh, amazed at how, how quickly we're becoming uh, a more diverse community. And what we saw, and you'll see as you look at the goals in just about each section, is it's woven throughout those are goals that I think would best be described as celebrating and embracing diversity, rather than, again, running from that to say, this is an opportunity for our community. And you might look at economic vitality, and the uh, goal deals with when people arrive here with great skills, but maybe not the pro proper credentials, how do we make sure we're, we're not um, underutilizing their abilities that they've, they've come here with and having goals that, that can really help with that. In social services, it might be how do we make sure we're delivering services that are really engaging and empowering people from, from diverse backgrounds. Um, in quality of life area, it was how do we make sure we're, we're really celebrating these other cultures. So you'll see that theme uh, throughout. 
And then the third overarching message, I would say, would be confronting challenges of growth. This, on the one hand, they're saying we want to keep moving forward, um, but on the other hand, there are challenges with that. And so if you were to look at the comments, a lot of comments dealing with um, perceptions about public safety, about uh, traffic and roads, about managing infrastructure as we grow. And so the recognition that that, that moving forward doesn't come without the, the tension and to, to make sure that those are priorities. So those were what I would call a few themes. I don't want to lift one goal or one group's work over the other because they're all equally important. Um, but those are a few things that I think you'll see throughout as you look at this. To, to just hit on maybe a, a couple items from each of the, the key performance areas, the education group, um, they, one of the guiding statements they have is their goal for our community was that we would begin earlier and have higher expectations. And so you'll see in some of their goals that uh, they're talking about education all along the spectrum, but looking at, at pre-K education all the way through lifelong learners, uh, that they're taking a look at how do we create healthy environments for students to learn both while they're at school and away from school and recognizing that, that both of those environments are important. Um, you'll see all those things as far as having higher expectations for what we do for our, our youth in the community. In economic vitality, um, one of the ideas there was diversifying our economic sector. Uh, specifically in doing that, we are going to be able to um, provide better wages for people in our community and, and um, improve the quality of life. And looked at that from how do we create an environment that, that allows for the growth of jobs. Um, but also looking at education and how do we develop those educational programs that we need in this area in order to fuel that workforce that will attract those kinds of jobs. Let's keep moving on. And, and quality of life, um, assure safe and healthy neighborhoods. Um, that dealt in some ways with um, public safety issues and whether it's neighborhood associations and, and police presence in neighborhoods. Um, also dealt with enhancing amenities. Um, People love their parks and they want to continue to, uh, to make those a priority in our community, whether it's uh, neighborhood parks, uh, indoor pools, those are things we're identified as things they want to continue uh, to provide for our community. And then also looking at how, from a development aspect, how do we incorporate um, some of these quality of life issues into neighborhoods as they develop them so that um, there's um, a variety of abilities to walk and, and get to different amenities um, from neighborhoods and maybe away from the traditional model. So uh, a few of those goals, again, to assure the safe and healthy aspect of our community and our neighborhoods. In the social services area, which is really um, dealing with, um, you know, elite, um, meeting the, the needs of, of our, our citizens here in community, improving access, collaboration, and inclusiveness was a priority. You saw goals relating to diversity, um, looking at the continu continuum of care for behavioral health and substance abuse issues, realizing that those are at the root of some of the, the challenges that we have. Um, affordable housing uh, emerged in that area as well as in the, the local government services area. So a acknowledgement that the access to affordable housing is a is a priority uh, for the citizens of this community. And then finally, uh, the area of local government services, which really looks at, at local government, um, civic engagement and leadership, infrastructure planning. Um, that group wants to build on intergovernmental relationships, acknowledging that a lot has happened and and I guess I think overall good feelings about the cooperation and collaboration between governmental entities would like to see more of that as we have to plan for uh, continuing growth um, and planning for infrastructure, uh, public transit and water development were things that, that emerged um, from that group as well. So this is just me buzzing real quickly through a lot of these things, but I think that might give you a, an idea of the types of things that are in this, uh, in this plan. Again, this was um, our fellow citizens that, that gathered to, to talk about this. It was a facilitated process, but it wasn't a consultant um, bringing, bringing information from another community for us to apply here. This was uh, the people saying, this is what we want to see happen in the Sioux Falls area. What, um, what we hope will happen from this and what I, I can uh, talk from my organization's perspective, uh, the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation is already committed. We are going to um, put on some programming this fall. Um, about uh, cultural competencies to start talking about diversity and as we have increasing diversity how do we uh, we make sure we're having the conversations about um, knowing how to live and work with each other in, uh, in healthy ways and um, so that's one piece we make this uh, the items identified in this plan get extra priority in our grant making that we do as a foundation 
Um, Sumo Empire United Way has already indicated there's a few items in the social services plan that they intend to, to prioritize. Um, I don't want to speak for Mike Lynch in the chamber, but they've also said as the next Forward Sioux Falls plan uh, comes together, this document will be useful in their, their planning. So we're excited to know that it's already being, being used as a resource and a tool to help us know what, uh, what are the people in the community would like. Uh, the next steps, um, the steering committee will come back in March of 2015 to talk about, you know, what are we already seeing as far as um, some of these ideas being met in the community. And then we plan to reconvene every two years to, again, keep our eye on this and see are there areas that haven't, haven't seen a lot of movement and is there anything additional that we could do to, um, to kind of spur some activity in those areas. So uh, this is, again, the plan. I'd like to thank you. Uh, for being one of the seven sponsoring organizations of this and providing the, uh, the, the leadership and the funding to, to make this a possibility. Thank you, Andy. And again, one of the primary reasons that they're here is to, since we do help them economically, it's good that we stay informed on what they do. So questions of Andy, Mike, or Mary? Councillor Jameson. Uh, not so much maybe a, well, I guess there's a question here, Andy. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for all your work. You bet. Uh, when I looked at the overreaching, uh, overarching goals, I guess you'd call it uh, cultural uh, diversity, celebrating that. But the other one with uh, confronting uh, challenges of growth. Um, and then when you get down to the local government side about uh, fostering that cooperative relationship between those governmental agencies, uh, I'm just wondering if you would be a great uh, mediator or some kind of a uh, facilitator to bring the city and the counties together. Now, we meet often in different uh, breakfast clubs, breakfast uh, meetings that we kind of put on uh, once a month and then we're off for the summer, but it's pretty casual. It's not a constructive, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a uh, a meeting with a strict agenda to accomplish something to get done. It's just meant to foster good relationships. But would you guys be interested and would it even be appropriate to have you uh, facilitate something where you brought the city, Mayhawk County and Lincoln County together and, and said, okay, we want to address this challenging of growth that we have in our community, this great city that we have. How can we work better together? Would you guys be capable? Or is that, am I even out of order? Or what do you think? I would say, you know, from a Sioux Falls, look, my Sioux Falls Tomorrow hat on, this was a planning process and not a, a continuing organization. And so we, we plan to get the band back together every so often to, to check on how things are going. Um, don't know that that as an entity is something that continues to exist, but every 10 years. Um, that's not something that Community Foundation currently does. Um, I'm not saying we wouldn't be interested in helping foster that. I, I don't want to uh, commit to that role because that's not something we currently do. But um, that kind of collaboration is certainly exactly what I think people in this plan had in mind. Whoever is the facilitator of that process, um, I think that's definitely within the spirit of, of what they were talking about when they put this together. Well, I would like to express my support for that uh, spirit to live on <laughs> and whatever we can do with this uh, to foster that uh, to occur. I don't know what we can do ex exactly yet right now, but I like this plan. When people like this work together, and I, mean, I think years ago, if I remember, one of the main things they talked about was an event center. Yes. And that that was a priority item for the community to figure out and solve. And that got done. And this is a great roadmap for us to follow again. And we've got to use this stuff. And I think they've identified a challenge, at least that I'm aware of, about uh, sure. cooperating and solving problems with the other <coughs> governmental bodies, including Minnehaha County and crime and those kinds of issues. So. Um, Let's make sure we don't just put this on a shelf. Okay. Two questions from me, I guess. Councillor Jamison, are you volunteering to f facilitate? I would love to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Might have to work on that. And the second one, who, what other funding sources are there for this whole project? We give 5000 um, All seven sponsoring organizations contributed that uh, identical amount. Okay. And then the Community Foundation uh, covered the, the staffing. Just um, there was no allocation to that that was just a part of our operations so Councillor Anderson Greg I was thinking uh, if not the Community Foundation uh, that might be a good job for CCOG too since all three of us are members 
Exactly. They might be able to facilitate something too. And our CCOG rep, I think, is Councillor Rolfing, right? Or I serve on enough of them, and so does I am. so do a bunch of other ones. But uh, okay. yeah, we have several of you, Councillor Rolfing. Um, I I took the time to read through this whole report. Thank and, you. Um, I thank you because there's some good stuff here. My, my, my not my concern, but my my hope is that uh, there will be some follow through, that we will hold some people accountable um, if we can on these. That this is kind of the roadmap we want to go on, and that there's so much good things, good things done. If we get half of what's in here done, which I think we can, or more. Um, we're going to assure that Sioux Falls is uh, progressing nicely in the next 10 years. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. So I hear some interest in maybe pursuing a little bit more collaboration between our governments, and maybe we can pursue that through CCOG. So I'm going to ask that those reps maybe bring that up at that, at that meeting at their next discussion. So thank you. Councilor Jamison. We do have a UDC meeting Thursday, but... Uh, so certainly we'll be in the building and we could talk to it uh, Lynn Keller Forbes for sure and uh, I'll do what I can thank you all righty thank you thank you Andy that is our last presentation any other new business okay I'm gonna adjourn this meeting and immediately following it it is now quarter after so roughly at 527 we will begin the land use committee meeting, which has a very interesting agenda also. So meeting adjourned. <laughs>